how much concentration is enough. Enough to observe your own mind in action. And because the actions of the mind exist on many levels, they're going to be love, many levels of concentration. And as a general rule of thumb, the more concentration the better, as long as it's mindful. Sometimes you hear that mindfulness and concentration are two separate states of mind. Mindfulness is open and accepting and devoid of agendas, whereas concentration is exclusionary and made out of effort. But that's not true. The Buddha talks about mindfulness in many ways where it has to be very focused. He says, when you see that there's an unskillful mind state, you try to get rid of it as quickly as possible in the same way that if your hair were on fire, you'd bring a lot of mindfulness and effort, he said, to putting out the fire. In other words, that's what you'd remember. This is what needs to be taken care of first. It's your top priority. An obvious case where mindfulness isn't just accepting the fact that the f flames are lighting up your head and they're yellow and they're blue and they're green. You don't want your hair to be on fire, so you put it out right away. And whatever else you're doing at that time, you have to stop and let it go. Focus totally on putting out the fire. And that, he says, is a factor of mindfulness. As for concentration, you want the kind of concentration where you are aware and alert. The qualities you bring to concentration are the same ones that you bring to a mindfulness practice. Ardent, alert, mindful. Simply that they get more and more focused. You're more and more continuous in your focus. So as you're here trying to stay focused on the breath, the first thing you want to keep in mind is that everything that you're going to pay attention to for the next hour has to be related to the breath. If it's not related to the breath, you don't want it. That's something you keep in mind. You're mindful that this is where you're going to stay. And of course, the mindfulness on its own can't do the work. That's why we bring in the alertness and the ardency. You're alert to notice what's happening, and you're ardent about doing this well, sticking with what you made up your mind to, to do. And trying to do it with some skill. And as you're doing this, you'll begin to see the mind a lot more clearly, because the activity of the mind is focused right here. This is the whole point of concentration practice. It's not like you're trying to get the mind into the deepest, ultimate concentration and just leave it there. You want to observe the mind in action. This is one of the kinds of concentration where you can't observe the mind. They're not really necessary. The Buddha talks about taking the mind all the way through what he calls the dimension of nothingness. And when you're in those states, there are basically two levels to being in them. One is when you're totally with the object. It's like putting your hand all the way into a glove. And then as you get really good staying there, then you can pull back a little bit and observe what you've got. That's taking, like taking your hand part way out of the glove, but not all the way. The Buddha calls this having your theme well in hand, well penetrated. In other words, you're able to observe the mind as it's engaged in what it's doing. And what is it doing? Basically, same thing as the aggregates do any time. Aggregates is an unfortunate term that we've used in English. It makes it sound like it's a pile of gravel, lots of little things. Actually, they're activities. Feeling feels, perception perceives, fabrications fabricate, consciousness cognizes. Even form, the Buddha says, is a type of activity. It's constantly deforming. And all these things are present right here. The form, of course, is the breath. The feeling is the sense of ease you try to create with the breath. 
and you learn a lot about creating feelings. Feelings don't just kind of come and go on their own. There's an element of fabrication in how we relate to the feeling. Some pains, if you think about them in a certain way, are painful. In other, in other ways, they're actually pleasant. The pain, say, of a good massage, because you know that it's meant to cure, actually becomes pleasant. We can do it the other way around as well. We can t turn certain pleasures into pains. There's a potential there, and we've learned how to work with it in one way or another. And when we're working with the meditation, we're trying to learn how to work with the breath and breath energies in the body in a way that you can create a sense of well-being, let it spread throughout the body. That requires not only the feeling, but also the perception, the mental image you hold in mind while you're doing this, that keeps you with the breath. Then there are fabrications which ask questions. Is this as comfortable as it could be, or is it still lacking something? Come up with ideas about how to stay with the breath or how to get more closely snug with the breath, or how to let go of certain activities that you've carried into the concentration that after a while are no longer necessary. The John Fuang's images of setting concrete, you need a form to pour the concrete, as long as the concrete is still not set. But once the concrete is set, you can take the form away. There comes a point in the meditation where all the evaluation gets to be too much, and you can just drop it. Then you have to learn how to judge at that point. If you find you can just be with a sensation of the breath, and you don't have to worry about changing it. And you can stay there. Okay, stay there. And you find that the concentration gets more solid, and the burden of the concentration gets less. That's a lot of what insight practice is in the concentration, is learning how to observe what you're doing, how you relate to the object, and how you might do it with more finesse, less effort, and great, greater stillness. And of course, there's the con consciousness of all these things, awareness of what you're doing. So we've got all five aggregates right here. We tend to feed off these activities in unskillful ways, but when you're doing concentration, you're learning how to feed off them in ways that are really skillful and nourishing for the mind. At the same time, you're putting yourself in a good position to observe the mind in action. Look at what you're doing while you're doing it. to see the ways in which you fabricate your experience. Fabricate doesn't mean total lying to yourself. It means simply that you put things together in your own way. And we're here to learn about how we're doing this in unskillful ways, how some of our habits really do get in the way of happiness, even though we've been holding on to them and we learn at one point that they might be useful, but we're learning to use them, or we've started using them in ways that are not helpful. And you want to be able to see that. You would think that people would be very observant of the minds, but it's usually the last thing they're observant of. It's like that finger pointing to the moon. You can take that image and turn it around. Sometimes you're told that, well, you don't want to mistake the finger for the moon. But here you're learning how to, instead of allowing the finger to direct your attention to the moon. You stay focused at the finger. What's this finger? Who's behind the finger? What intentions do they have? What are they trying? How are they trying to deceive us? You follow the finger up the arm to the person pointing. That's when you learn a lot about the mind. This applies to all the different types of meditation you can be doing, and all the different ways you have of dealing with problems in the mind. When you're dealing with lust and developing perceptions of the unattractiveness of the body, it's not the case that you're going to finally come to that golden perception that's going to totally eradicate all, all lust or attachment or pride in the body. It's you want to observe the mind as you're trying to fight your old habits of seeing the body as beautiful or as substantial or something really worthwhile. 
And you begin to see, well, what's the difference between the times when you're focusing on it as unattractive and the times when you're focusing on it as attractive? What's going on? What are the processes that make the switch? Similarly with goodwill. There's, sometimes you hear that all you do is just have lots and lots and lots of goodwill, and that will take you all the way to awakening. But goodwill is a fabrication. It's something you have to intend. And it was, it's when you see the part of the mind that pulls away, doesn't want to engage in goodwill. And you realize that both sides are fabricated, both the side that's willing to engage in thoughts of goodwill and the other side that has some thoughts of anger or ill will. You have to ask yourself, when the mind chooses sides, what's going on? What's the process? It's when you learn how to take these processes apart. That's when you break through to something that's not fabricated. I was talking a while back to someone who said it's totally impossible for a human being to experience something that's unconditioned. Well, that's that idea is based on a definition of what a human being is and what a human being can know which is the, totally the opposite of what the Buddha's mode of exploration was. He put aside all definitions of what he was or who he was and looked at the processes of the mind, figure out, okay, what can be known, what can, it, what can be experienced here when you take apart all these different fabrications and develop dispassion for them. And this dispassion doesn't mean you, you hate these things. The word actually comes from the sense of having enough food. Again, you've been feeding off the aggregates, and there comes a point where you decide, I've had enough. This feeding activity is like chewing on old bones that don't have any more meat. Maybe there's something better. And for different people, it will be at a different point in their meditation. Some people it's when they're contemplating the body, other people it's when they're trying to develop thoughts of goodwill, others when they're focused on the breath. Your ability to see the mind in action as it switches from one topic to another or switches from one perception to another. You see the process of fabrication and all of a sudden it loses all of its appeal. Because you realize no matter which direction you go, there's going to be stress. This is why the Four Noble Truths are the framework that you hold in mind as you're looking at things. Because you know it's okay, if there's stress, there's got to be a cause. What are you doing at the same time that you're experiencing this stress? What are you doing that's making the level of stress go up or down? If it's making it go up, how can you stop doing that? That's what it means to abandon the cause of stress. You stop doing it. Because you see the connection, and the only way you're going to see the connection is if the mind is still enough engaged in an activity right here, here in the present moment. Then it's you're watching yourself as you're engaged in that activity. You're watching the processes. That's where you see something that's totally free of conditions. And then you know at that point that even though someone else could tell you, no, you couldn't see that, their words have no impact on you at all, because you know what you've seen. And in the process of getting the mind really still through the concentration, you've learned how to observe the mind reliably. And it's going to take a while to be really reliable in your powers of observation. You have some false assumptions, but if you watch carefully enough and if you're developing enough integrity, you'll see through it. You'll see through those false assumptions. And so you know if something is fabricated or if something is not fabricated. And that's when all your doubts about the Buddha and the Dhamma the Sangha are gone. That he really did teach something that is timeless. He knew what he was talking about. 
and it wasn't a teaching that depended on his culture or his time. The teaching really does have something of essence, something of really solid value here. But it requires that you watch yourself very carefully, look at what you're doing. This is why it's important to get the mind into concentration in a way where you can observe yourself. Sometimes you hear that you've got to get the mind into deep concentration where you can't hear or see or sense anything. But again, the Buddha never said that. There's the, you know, the case of Alara Kalama, who had been the Buddha's teacher before he gained awakening, and was not awakened. But he did have very strong concentration. They talk about one time where he was sitting right next to a path, a, a road actually. Five hundred carts went past. He heard, didn't hear a sound. He was so deep in concentration. But that was it. He was just concentrated. No insight, no ability to observe the mind, or he wasn't inclined to observe his mind. That was what was lacking in his concentration. And then there's the case of Moggallana, the Buddha's foremost student in terms of his psychic powers. His concentration was good enough to rival the Buddha in terms of psychic powers. But he told the monks one time that even when he was in what's called the interbable concentration, which is, starts with the fourth jhana and on up, he could still hear sounds outside. The monks got upset. They thought he was making false claims. They went to see the Buddha. The Buddha said, no, what he said is true. There is that state of concentration where the mind is imperturbable, but it still hears sounds. He said it's not the totally pure concentration, but after all, Moggallana was an arahant. If it was good enough for him, it's good enough. So it's not a question of trying to make your ears go deaf. But you do want the kind of concentration that is still enough so you can see very slight movements in the mind, and is mindful enough so you remember to pose questions. Once you're really firmly there, then you start posing questions about it. So you can see. Okay, what's going on here? What intentional elements are keeping this going? Or are they causing stress? Those are the questions that lead to insight. So we're here to watch ourselves in action and do what you can to get the mind still enough so you can really see actions of the mind that you haven't noticed before, because they're all going on all the time. This is why the path is gradual, why, why it takes a lot of practice, because you, you've got to get your powers of discernment more and more subtle. And that comes from getting better and better at the concentration. So the question is to how much concentration is enough? The only way you can answer that is developing as much, much concentration as you can and learning how to use it properly. There's no one, one size fits all. Some people can hit the first jhana and bang, there they are. Other people have to spend a long time, a long time in concentration, get really, really deep. In and out, in and out, many times. before they see what they're doing in a way that really breaks through. As for where you'll be on that continuum, there's only one way to find out, and that's to get your mind really, really still and watch. In other words, you have to answer that question for yourself.